I decided that uh, although the mission had lots of uh, scientific content to actually discuss other aspects of it, and I see I've been preceded and stuck with the title that was uh, given to me by Forrest and Piers, which at first I didn't understand, but it immediately has come to me. Uh, uh, and I will reveal a secret in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, I had multiple roles in Fife and Boreas, as you'll see in a moment. But one of the secrets is they snuck this little thing in here, thanks to Bob Murphy, I believe, okay, uh, which we call five skis at points. <laughs> and Bob actually gave me what I thought was a thrilling honor. That's E01, incidentally. We have a whole bunch of shots of the uh, kinds of prairie if you guys want to do some follow-up work. Okay. Uh, but what happened was that uh, Bob gave me this thrilling trip to get to, to Russia. He said, look, you know, I had a reservation on Pan Am, booked through the agency, and, and, and Bob, you told me that, no, 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 we have a reciprocal agreement with the Soviet Union, they have to pay for some of it, that I have to go pick up a ticket somewhere in New York. You gave me an address, I went there, it was a CD tenement, I had to go to apartment 4D <laughs> to get the tickets, I got it, and I got on this Aeroflot. <laughs> flight, and, and Bob was very, uh, you know, benevolent in terms of saying, well, I'll give you the opportunity to do that. Well, first we stop in Labrador, get out of the plane, we're put in the duty-free shop area over there, and told that <laughs> we had to stay there a couple hours until we bought some stuff. Okay. Okay, then we keep going. Okay, where do we stop? We're going to heading for Moscow. They say, oh, no, wait a minute. We fly down. We're in Shannon, <laughs> at the, uh, again, in the duty-free or whatever it was called. And again, we had to, you know, got hit, hit up. And, the, and then when we go back on, people are standing in the aisles, smoking. And it, it, was, it was quite an experience. I think I did manage to get on Pan Am coming home. I'm not sure, quite sure. Okay. At any rate. You're welcome. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, you see, he's not denying it, guys. Okay, okay. Uh, my roles were, I was a project scientist for the FIS. Uh, I thought that was a great honor. Uh, I was not even a Goddard, I was a GIS at that time, still up in New York uh, with Jim Hansen. And, was, and so uh, I basically uh, was told that I was to be the FIS project scientist. Hmm. Well, I learned very, very quickly that what was needed was to basically f form some kind of barrier so that peers didn't have to deal with Don Strebel. This is peers and forest. Okay? So my initial idea was, uh, to, or, 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 or basically direction was given to me to kind of protect these guys from that and have this role where I was a, a project scientist and had the foggiest idea of what had to be done and, 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 and had this, well, pretty soon, uh, I was protecting these guys from uh, uh, peers because I realized they had to get stuff done. And uh, no, ma no matter how Don came on, he, he did the work and got the job done. Okay. I won't talk about this. <laughs> we were being videotaped. Okay. <laughs> but Don and, 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 and Dave, uh, they know quite well what I'm talking about here. So we'll, we'll, we'll skip over that one. Okay, my next role was to be uh, the mass, uh, and for those of you who don't know what mass is, it's the uh, MODIS uh, you know, uh, uh, simulator, uh, airborne simulator for the MODIS uh, system. And this was uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, Mike King's instrument. Okay. He, he was a MODIS uh, scientist, chief scientist uh, and, uh, of the MODIS science team, and he, he had this mass, which has now been come master. You may have heard of the master instrument that's been flown around. But anyway, uh, he was very, very protective of this, and it was always on the ER-2. And somehow, Piers talked him into allowing it to go on the C-130. And then he just needed somebody to ride along with it. Now, let me tell you, this was an autonomously operated uh, instrument, because if it's on the ER-2, there's only one person who goes on the ER-2. That's the pilot up front. And so he just presses a button at the beginning of the trip, and then everything else is done by it. Okay. So I basically went along to just sit on the C-130, which flew almost at the same altitude as the uh, Twin Otter, except with one exception. It's a huge aircraft, as, as you all know. You just heard about it. Uh, the flight deck is very nice. It's up a flight of stairs. But inside is a little bit different, particularly with the rear door open. And there, there was Jim Wang at the rear door, 
he was, a, there's something called a push boom radiometer, microwave radiometer. He was doing soil moisture measurements with that because it's sensitive to the dielectric constant of what's underneath. And uh, he was tethered and deploying it halfway out the door. And we weren't too far back from him, okay? And, and, and so we were in there and it was, it was a pretty bumpy ride. Uh, and I, I did look at the data and so on. Uh, the trade-off for this was I had a cushy uh, experience because I was once again selected during the 94 thing to be the MODIS Airborne uh, simulator guy, which kept me in Spokane, Washington, nice and snug and warm. And mostly I would go in and get a call from peers and saying that the weather was uh, n not, not convenient for a flight, and so I would just go to movies and stuff like that. It was kind of... <laughs> Oh, incidentally, at one point during Five, a whole bunch of us, I don't know if any of you in the room remember this, we went to see a James Bond movie with a C-130, and then inexplicably to other patrons in the theater, uh, when the C-130 opened and the tanks flew out of it, everybody just stood up and cheered and shouted. <laughs> People in the theater were wondering what the hell was going on. Okay. Okay, now this is what I got paid to do, actually. I got a grant from uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to do the soil moisture measurements uh, with uh, by basically a dielectric probe that measured the dielectric constant of the uh, uh, of the soil. It was operated at 10 megahertz, and it de directly detected the volumetric moisture uh, from the dielectric constant. Uh, I won't go into the details. I promise not to do any science. Remember. So, but w what happened was this was very consistent with anchoring and giving some reality to the measurements being made by the PBMR. Uh, now, Corex, okay, here it is. Can, uh, Bob, do you still remember your Russian? Is Moskva v Kursk, from Moscow to Kursk. Okay, the in situ measurement, that's what the, that's what the soil moisture probe looked like. It was capable of uh, basically non-destructive sampling. That's why it was so useful. And this is something that I was told a lot when we were there. This is uh, Nia Problema, or sometimes there's a T here, it's Nyet Problema, uh, which basically, initially I thought meant no problem, but it really was, you know, forget it, <laughs> you know, no solution, <laughs> not worth thinking about. Okay. During this time, I think the only person who went into this in-between thing, which was also a skip, was Charlie Walthall, uh, was in the room. Was anybody else at Korsk and all the other, Boris, not just Charlie. Uh, Charlie, do you remember when we went up in a helicopter and you were very, very nervous. We were, you were sitting, or I was sitting on the uh, gas tank. Forget boots and tennis shoes and so on. And the guys up front were smoking. <laughs> I was driving you nuts. And then all of a sudden we're going over a, where are you, Charlie? I don't see, oh, oh, okay. You switched sides, okay. You remember we flew over kind of a, kind of was a river or a creek and there were two girls down with, and the, and the pilots landed. It was kind of weird. <laughs> I decided, decided not to take data the rest of the day. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so it was, that was quite an experience that you, you submitted, you subjected us to uh, back there. Okay. Anyhow, uh, then the next thing in my experience at Boreas, at sensor radiance related to X and Y coordinates, that's the map. You can read that yourself. I won't bother. But what it amounts to is uh, that here I am in Spokane. This is not me. <laughs> it's about as rotund as I was, but this guy is pressurized. That's why he looks quite so robust. And he bears a striking resemblance to the front of the ER2. <laughs> but that was really quite a nice little aircraft there, as you can see. Here it is, uh, getting ready to take off, or uh, I don't think it's just land. Here's what, what they call the chase car. And the, you see these wheels? Uh, the wings are huge, very, very large, very long, very light, and, and, and they actually, there's little skids here because they can touch the ground. This holds it above, and as it takes off, these fall off and we retrieve them. And I actually got to do that once or twice. And there it is taking off. You see the, the wings are gone, but actually I think it may in this case be landing. Uh, it was an interesting flight. Okay, now. For me, how did Fife and Boreas change my world? This is another little secret here that you guys can take with you and take some pleasure in. Uh, we heard about all the scientific results that came out of it, but just the idea of operating a field campaign and communications and all those challenges. 
Oh, you're looking at my little greeting here. Yeah, this was when my uh, EO one took off. I, I sent that out as my season's greeting card. It was in November of uh, 2000, at the turn of uh, when we're entering the new millennium. Uh, we had uh, to do some scrambling because we were going to originally launch sometime in March or April. Things got delayed for a variety of reasons. We thought the thing was not going to last a full year even, uh, even though it was supposedly an 18-month mission. So we needed to get some data. Okay? Um, so where can we get vegetating da vegetative data? It has to be in the southern hemisphere. Okay, so uh, in the uh, November, October, November time frame, I spent a lot of time in Alaska going to all these different areas. Uh, you see the hy hyperspectral uh, validation sites. So while I didn't have a lot of people, uh, well, there's the transportation. I have this time, so it won't take too much time. It's going off by itself. Uh, we had this twin otter at our disposal, supplied by the Australians. They were full participants at no cost. I'm going to go back for one second. I can cheat, you see. And you can notice this car has six different antennas. I mean, these guys were really, really marvelously equipped. And we did a lot of calibration there in the Southern Hemisphere. And you can see uh, the infrastructure was there. There were maybe a, a hundred people at least involved from Australia at no charge to NASA. And this is gratification, okay. Uh, this is really actually, uh, all this preceded the actual launch of EO-1. And there are people here, this is David Jubb. This, this guy's a legend, Dean Gratz, who was uh, their, their field expert. And that's uh, Ray Merton, uh, Nicholas uh, Koops here, you may re recognize him. Uh, this is David Jupp and a number of people. All right, we had fantastic team who were selected to do the work uh, on this thing. They were, they were selected, and Diane Wicklin's in the room. She, she worked effortlessly, you know, she was fantastically good in terms of getting the set up, getting everybody working together, getting complementarity. Uh, and you're reading the names as I'm talking. But what I did is I color coded this because these guys had their own pet projects. And I'm gonna go back because it's worth doing. Uh, but we were able to persuade them to go and go into the Southern Hemisphere and do the field work because we needed this as insurance that they would get their stipends if we went down in, in, in very quickly because we had no confidence that we'd go through the growing season. So we say, okay guys, just go put the stuff away. You don't have to do anything with it. Uh, you'll do your own, your own projects. And, and, but but uh, this was the beginning of uh, something really remarkable. If you read those names, uh, it's it just, uh, I'm, I'm absolutely in awe of some of these. Like, uh, we had Alex Getz, who, uh, you, you know, working, uh, w doing his, his spectroscopy, uh, land base. He, he is the ASD person. Um, then you see, uh, well, I, the first one is Greg Asner. He's here, here twice. He, we had 31 uh, approved proposals and 30 investigators. As remarkable as it seems, he actually was awarded two of them. Many of these uh, were, were no cost uh, investigations as well. So, so this was a phenomenal team. And I learned very, very, very quickly that my job was to basically uh, tell them not what to do, but what was needed and let them determine what to do to make that realization. And I conveyed that to uh, Gasa Masra at NASA headquarters a couple of times. Uh, to, to, so that he would understand that this team had to be supported and we had to give them what they needed to get their job done. So it was quite an experience. Uh, so here, uh, hombre con sombrero, that's the hat. Okay, that's how I was known throughout uh, Argentina. We attracted an enormous amount of attention. You see all the uh, mostly press people here. and. Let's go on. This gets enlarged here. There's the avarices in that uh, twin otter. And there's Rob Green and Carlos Mojanos and myself. Here we are in, in Australia. This is afterward now. This is one we've already taken off doing some field work there and calibration work. Uh, this is the EO1 field campaign in C Central Australia. Afterward. Uh, this is a 4,000 meter elevation in, in, in northwestern Argentina, Salado Rosario. Um, 
he, this is Lawrence Ong and me. All these other guys came, uh, were supplied by the Argentinians at no cost again to NASA. It was a really remarkable cooperation. Uh, we had some major activities going on on two continents, both in the southern hemisphere. Uh, now, we had some unusual ways of getting data. This is uh, one instrument that actually deploy coincident with the ONALI overpasses to look uh, at Maricopa. Uh, this is uh, Mike Abrams uh, did some work in the Venice Lagoon. This place is the Institute of Hydrology. Uh, he told me that I could stay there, but I wouldn't want to because it was an old building with all this graffiti on the roof of uh, you know angels and stuff like that. <laughs> really shabby place. Okay. Uh, so again, this is instrumented. Uh, here is the Canadians. Uh, they actually wanted to sample the uh, canopy top. And this poor guy had to lean out and clip off some of the uh, vegetation. Now this is an interesting one. I don't know if you heard that, gunshot. <laughs> OK. Again, this is Mary Martin's group from New Hampshire. They, they would shoot down the leaves to get at it. And I had a hell of a time getting the Canadians to work with them. The ones who were clipping the leaves. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> okay, I'm finished now, pretty much. Uh, this is, this is, we're wrapping it up. This is the, uh, uh, trying to basically keep EO1 going for a while uh, tr through that. Then I got the DOD to work with us. <laughs> and then we're coming to the end here. Um, it was a toy, I could play with it. These are all acquired by EO1. And then this is, I'll leave you with this one as the last one. Why do I wear my hat? It's really a spectral calibration standard. <laughs> you don't believe it? <laughs> also, it's a very durable spectral calibration standard because it's crushable 